Today on Hands On Photography, I'm going to talk about all of the announcements regarding photography from Adobe Max. Stay tuned. Hands On Photography is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Using the same password everywhere is a security nightmare waiting to happen. LastPass easily creates unique passwords for every site. Visit lastpass.com slash twit. This is Twit. This episode of Hands On Photography is brought to you by Peak Design. They've launched their 10th campaign on Kickstarter, Mobile by Peak Design. To learn more, go to peakdesign.com slash twit. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Matt Pruitt. This is Hands On Photography here on Twit TV. I hope y'all are doing well. I am unbelievable as always. On this podcast, I like to share with you different tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer as well as a better post processor. In particular, with this this episode, we're going to talk about the post processing side of things. But before we get into that, I just want to say welcome to you that are just joining us for the first time. And um, while you're joining for the first time. Go ahead and hit that subscribe option in whatever podcast app you're listening to, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Google Podcasts or PlayerPod or Anchor or all of those popular apps. Go ahead and subscribe now that you're listening to us. We even have a YouTube channel. Uh, But if you just don't know how to get to all of the different subscription options, just go to the website, twit.tv slash hop. That's twit.tv slash H-O-P for hands-on photography. I appreciate you all joining me and I appreciate you growing the hands-on photography community and making this podcast so, so much more and more popular each and every week. Thank you for the support. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with this week's episode. Now, this is the week of Adobe Max 2020 um, kicking off. All of you know that I'm a big Adobe fan. Yes, it's well documented. I love me some Adobe, but I also like other products too. But Adobe is particularly the one used the most in my creative workflow for my own personal reasons. And um, so, yeah, during this during this time of year, each year, they, they like to have their creative conference to talk about the different updates and new releases and things like that for all of their products. And in particular to today, I want to talk about the photography side. we got some new updates to the world of Lightroom, as well as some updates to the world of Photoshop. Uh, some of it is just interface, user interface and different use cases and things like that. But the other part is some pretty daggum slick AI. Oh my goodness, it's really good. But first, let's go ahead and hop on into the, um, the my computer here, and we'll take a look at uh, Lightroom in the first little bit here. So I'm going to switch screens, go into Lightroom, and right now we're looking at a screen uh, with a picture that one of my great beloved friends uh, had taken over uh, out there in uh, Yosemite. And I did some post-processing on this already, so I'm not gonna run through a whole gamut of doing some retouching on this. It's a beautiful image, and I just tried to enhance this image uh, previously. Old pick, but anyway, neither here nor there. Let's talk about Lightroom. Uh, so if we look at the develop module here inside of Lightroom, we have all of our typical uh, you know, exposure and contrast and all of the basics that we talked about over this past year (laughs) of hands-on photography and the curves tools and things like that. But Lightroom has now, um, added a, well, not Lightroom, Adobe has now added a new color grading tool and color grading is something that you hear quite a bit in the world of videography and, in. Um, colorist for video for video editing but in the photography side you used to hear it referred to as split toning and if you go back to your previous versions of Lightroom you would see the split toning um, settings inside of that and it was okay I used it from time to time I'd much rather use Photoshop for getting split toning and color grading because it just had better tools quite frankly well with this new update Lightroom now has a color grading tool very similar to its video tool in Premiere Pro. And I absolutely love it. There is one little catch about it, but I really do love having this in here. But let me show it to you rather quickly here. So it's basically three color wheels. So you have the shadows, 
you have the midtones, and you have the highlights represented in three different color wheels. And above those color wheels, you can solo them and uh, just uh, click, say, the first one for shadows, next one for midtones, highlights, so forth. And the last one is for global, so it's for everything. But let's just go back to, say, the shadows. And if you think about this, take a look at the histogram up here at the top right. You'll know the shadows is closer to the left hand side of the histogram. And you notice the histogram has a, a bit of a color spectrum sort of splitting out there. You got a little bit of blue, a little bit of magenta splitting out there to let you know that those colors are hiding in that side of the of the uh, histogram. So let's take the shadows color wheel. And I'm looking at this and I'd like to really enhance the blue and, and teal of this image. So I'm going to just click right here in the center of the color wheel and I'm going to drag slightly towards the blue and teal like so. And the more I drag to the, towards that, towards the edge of the circle, it's going to give it even more saturation. Notice it now has a line showing up like that. But if I move up and down, I could go to a different hue. But if I want to just stay on this particular hue, I can hold down shift and I get this line to really intensify it by dragging all the way out to the edge for that particular hue. And I think this is a really, really, really nice tool. Oh my goodness. I love it. So now if I want to adjust the luminous value of this, meaning the brightness of that particular hue in the shadows, I just hit this uh, adjustment slider here for luminance and just take it up or down and you'll see some gradual changes in the shadows. Okay. So I'm taking the luminance away. So of course you're not seeing much, but as I pull it up, you will start to see a little more green, a little more teal showing up in the shadows. So I'm going to take it back just a touch. And now if I want to look at say the mid tones or look at the highlights, I'll just switch to a different circle color wheel if you will. All right. So let's look at the midtones. I want to take the midtones and deal more with the skin of my friend here, which is typically how you want to deal with uh, skin and whether it's photography or videos to work with the midtones. So I want to push that more towards that orange color like so. And notice the difference in the scene, because not only is it working on my friend's skin there, but it's also catching the other parts of the, the, the mid tones in the image that happens to have that same orange tone. So it's pushing that up. And as I increase the luminance, it makes it brighter or makes it darker. And you can work with this to your, to your, you know, taste or like. So I'm gonna put it right about there. And if it gets to a point where you don't like something, you can easily reset these little parameters here just by right clicking and saying reset. You can, since I'm working on the midtones, uh, Adobe was smart enough to put that at the very top of the list here, or just select the three way to reset all of them. And it's just pretty simple to do in one click. And I love this, but again, this feature comes from the video side of things in Premiere Pro and they got it right for the most part. The only thing that I'm struggling with just a bit is when you're inside of Premiere Pro and you start to move inside of the color wheels and, and just changing the hues, it is a really, really gradual movement that happens regardless of how much you're pulling your, your mouse or, or mo moving the uh, arrow keys on your keyboard. It's really, really gradual. Here in Lightroom, you can barely move it and it'll, it'll max it out. So you have to think that you're going to need a little more touch inside of Lightroom versus being inside of Premiere Pro. You get a little more precision inside of Premiere Pro in my, in my opinion, but overall, this is a great start um, to have this, this feature added to the product. Uh, I'm going to use it a little bit more often just to see if I can make it a normal part of my workflow instead of pushing it into Photoshop and doing my color grading over there using the gradient maps and, and filters and things like that, that I've already created over there. But yeah, this is a good start. Now I want to talk about some of the other features, uh, that Adobe has, has, uh, updated for Photoshop, but I want to take a few minutes to thank, whew, man. This week's sponsor, good old Peak Design. I'm so excited that they're sponsoring the show. 
This episode of Hands On Photography is brought to you by Peak Design. Peak Design just launched their 10th campaign on Kickstarter, Mobile by Peak Design, an ecosystem of cases, mounts, and accessories that make your phone a better tool for everything you do. It even works with the new iPhone 12 MagSafe system. These accessories use SlimLink, which has been added to their new everyday phone case. When paired with your mobile device, it connects with accessories such as a wallet with a built-in kickstand, charging and non-charging mounts for your car dash, hard locking mounts for total security, and so much more. To learn more about the Mobile by Peak Design campaign and all their other amazing products, head to peakdesign.com slash twit. Support Peak Design and visit peakdesign.com slash twit. All right, so now let's go ahead and take a look at Photoshop. Actually, hold on one second. My camera, ever since the Windows 10 update has happened last week, my camera has been just wigging out. Not sure why. So if my camera happens to freeze, it's okay. I have a backup camera just in case I need to switch to it. But hopefully that doesn't have to happen often during this show. Okay, so now we're going to carry on and we're going to look at my screen and hop on over into the wonderful world of Photoshop and look at some of these new examples uh, from from uh, Adobe that's particularly leaning more so on the AI side of things, artificial intelligence. Now, if you've been following me for the last several years, you know, I was at one point I had no love for AI coming into creativity, but. They proved me wrong with a lot of the different updates where they put AI in place where things that were repeatable tasks inside of creativity could be handled within a few clicks of the mouse or some keyboard strokes. Instead of doing it over and over and over and over, it really did make things a lot faster. And in this particular instance, I have a, a, an image here from Bodega Bay here in Northern California, and we want to talk about doing sky replacements. And the sky replacement in photography is pretty, hmm, it could be either really easy or really difficult. There's never an in-between, <laughs> never is, because you have to find your horizon line and you have to make sure you cut out everything, such as the details of the, the waves splashing right there and make sure it gets replaced behind that. And it's, yeah, it, it can be a bit of a task. So... Photoshop now has a built in tool here up under the edit menu that says sky replacement. Simple as that. So you click on that and it gives you a bunch of different options here. But there's there's some some beautiful magic that's happening. OK, so I have this first image. Of course, that that, that doesn't look good at all, but they give you a couple different default settings. You have blue skies, you have what they call spectacular and you have what they call sunset. Let's start with spectacular. Let's just scroll through here. I like the look of this one because of how it just works with the, the scene in the foreground. OK, I think that works. So I just click that and click off of this. And now I, if, if I want to play around with the sky's edges, I can shift the edges like so. And you see how it uh, shortened it. But I don't want to do that. I want to push it all the way as close as I can to that horizon of the ocean. And then you have brightness settings. So I'm going to take it all the way down to dark. Of course, that looks really, really bad. Let's make it sort of match up as best we can with the scene. We can even change the color temperature with this slider. So if I want to cool it off, make it even more blue, I can do so. If I want to make the sky replacement bigger, because this is essentially an image file being slapped into the background or slapped into the sky. If I want to make it bigger, I can scale it up like that. But I think that's boring. Let's bring it back back here because we've got a little more detail that way. You even have an option to flip it around. I'm not going to do that here. Now, notice this section here says the foreground adjustments. That's, that's here because when you're changing the sky, you have to think about um, lighting throughout the whole scene. And you want it to try, to try to match up through the scene. And if you look at this foreground, I have a pretty bright sun right next to the camera. Uh, lots of deep shadows on the left. So I could play around and make sure it matches up all the way through the scene. If I pull it all the way to the left and decrease the light adjustment, you notice it starts to spread the light all the way through to the, the the background there. And that's pretty close to what I want, but I went a little bit too far. So I'm going to dial it back just a touch. 
and it looks pretty good. And if I want to adjust the colors of it a little bit, I can. And it'll do it on a really, really gradual state. I love this. So we're just going to push it just a touch like that. And I think that looks pretty good. And then when you're done, you can output this to a to a brand new layer or just duplicate what you already been working with and you're seeing here in Photoshop. So I'm going to pull it out to new layers because I think when you're working in Photoshop, it's so much easier to work in layers and non-destructively and you can make so many different minor and small adjustments. So we'll go ahead and click OK. And boom, that's done. So if you look over here in the layer panel over here on the right, you'll see that it's created a bunch of different adjustment layers for us, as well as created some layer mask and all of this that could just be absolutely adjusted to our liking if we want to. I mean, right here, this is a curves adjustment. So I'm going to click on that. And let's just say I want to give it a little more contrast. So I'm going to put a point right there in the middle, drag down the shadows just a touch to give us a nice little S curve and play with the highlights and it works. And again, that sky is replaced and that sky is now fitting into my scene just with a couple clicks of the button. And that's way faster than if I wanted to do this manually by importing an image myself, placing it, masking it out, feathering it. And whew, it's a long story, trust me. All right, so now let's take a look at another scene here. Now this image, this is a, a raw file um, and haven't been processed or anything like that, but I want to do a couple things here. I want to play with the sky replacement, but I also want to play with the AI that's going to work on my face. <laughs> this is so crazy, but it's really, really good. So I'm going to take this layer and let's see, I'm going to grab my selection here. And if I wanted to, I could write just draw a selection around my face like that. The thing is, it's not necessary. The AI is going to automatically pick that up. So I'm going to deselect that. I'm going to go up to our filters and check out the brand new neural filters found in Photoshop. Let's click on neural filters. It's going to load up a couple different things here. You'll see skin smoothing. And if, if this is your first time opening it up, you'll have to download these modules. You'll see a little cloud icon right there to download them. You have skin smoothing, which I don't particularly want to do that to me, but I get it. That's perfect for retouching. You can see in the example, it's a really common thing to do when you're retouching photos, but I don't want to do that. I'm going to go down to this other layer it has a lot of different beta tools and this is the smart portrait. So I'm going to turn on smart portrait and notice it now has this blue rectangle around my face because it recognizes the head uh, in the image. But look at the parameters here. You have happiness, surprise, anger, facial age, hair thickness, all kinds of different parameters when you're dealing with the human. So let's play around with just how happy I am. I'm going to click the happy icon checkbox there, and I'm just going to push the value up just a touch and watch what happens to my mouth here. So I'm pushing up this value and all of the processing is happening in the cloud. This isn't happening on my computer. So depending on your internet speed, it may take a little bit longer. Now look at that. Now notice that not only did my lips move just a touch, it also moved some of the skin around my, my eyes and my forehead to change my expression. Now, if I really want to get, you know, pretty wild with this, I can crank it all the way up to the max just to see what happens. It's going to be pretty interesting. It may not be perfect, but it'll be interesting to say the least. Now look at that. They even put some teeth in here. My teeth don't look like that. <laughs> I've had some other examples I've played with earlier today where it did look pretty close to my teeth, but this is pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. So now let's change this happiness and go all the way to the negative side of things and watch what happens. <laughs> 
it's it's really really nice basically what happened was it did a liquefy filter on my face to move my skin around to make it look like i was frowning so let's do this i'm going to take it up to a little bit more on the happy side just a touch so it'll look a little bit more natural and good that's done so next let's look at facial age so i'm going to check this box for facial age and i'm oldish i'm not a young man i'm not an old man i'm a oldish man so let's see what it would look like if i were just a little bit older so i'm going to drag this up to say 20 or so and there you have it look at the look at my beard it knew I had gray hair in my beard. It already added more <laughs> into the scene to make it look natural. Now, this part up here around my head where it's trying to add some hair to my head, that doesn't work so well, but we'll get into that here in a second. But I think that's looking pretty solid. Now, let's say if I wanted to look younger, so I'm going to drag it all the way back to a young whippersnapper, Aunt Pruitt. And there you have it. So now we zoom in on this. My face is a little bit slimmer and a little bit smoother somehow. So let's take it back. I'm going to pull this up to be older again, just for kicks and giggles. Okay. Now, so we have a, a slight expression change and we have changed my age just a touch here in this image. And again, it's not perfect, but it's OK. This is Photoshop and we can easily output this to layers. So let's do this. We'll say uh, duplicate the layer and mask it and then we'll click OK. So now it's going to think and process it. And it gives me over here in the layer stack everything that has been changed. So now let's look at this image. Let's let's zoom in. Look at my head. It's not quite right there. OK. I have a weird shape head, but it's not that weird. So I'm going to click on the layer mask there and we can use our brush tool and make adjustments to make this look a little bit more natural. OK, we've talked about layer mask way back on episode 12. So I'm just going to brush in. Using white. Make sure everything is clear and it is. So now I'll go to black. Make our adjustments blending it in like so. So now my head shape is looking better. And then remember we were talking about the hair showing up on the side of my head. Don't need that. So let's just brush it away because it's on a layer mask. We're back to just seeing my skin and even down to look at how there's this little bit of an edge right there that's an artifact that shouldn't be there. So let's fix that. Feels weird using my mouse, but I'm just going to roll with this. Normally I'd like to use my Wacom tablet. You notice. And see when you zoomed in, you can see all of those little details a little bit better and just fine tune it because you're using layer mask. And it looks much better. So let's zoom out and look at that folks. <laughs> we have a gray beard added there on my face. My expression is just slightly different. And if I want to continue to do some other adjustments, I can just carry on just like I would with any other post processing. Let's just add a um, curves layer again. Let's bring up the, Highlights just a touch. My face is looking better. It's not all blacked out. Has some color, has some light. It's pretty good, right? Not bad. So now this was the before. Let me group this together for you. That's the before. And this is the after. <laughs> It's not bad. Okay, so one more thing before we go. 
we let's do a sky replacement on this. And this is going to be a little bit more difficult because you have the trees in the background. Remember, we talked about getting the background to look just right um, when you're dealing with with edges and leaves and foliage and even my head. So let's go with the sky replacement. So I'm going to go edit. Oh, I can't be on a group. Here we go. So we'll say file, uh, edit. I'm going to adjust my layer. Come on, Ant. You've done this before. Edit sky replacement. So now we have our sky replacement menu. And yeah, that sky is what we used a second ago, but I want to use something a little more sunset ish. Uh, let's go with this color. How does that look? Not bad. Let's take a look at, say, oh, there's a rainbow there. Oh, yeah. Let's see. So I'm going to cancel out of this and I'm going to make sure I'm clicked on the proper layer. Edit. Sky replacement. Rainbow. It's processing. It's adding some different masking. And you notice how it changes the mask. This is something that you have to consider when you're doing these sky replacement is you have to look at, okay, what kind of masking did I use previously and how can I make these adjustments? And it's okay. You, if you want to spend more time on it, you can, I wanted to show that with a bit of a trial and error for you. So I'm going to go back. There you go. All right. So now, Let's play around with some of the lighting a little bit. Change the temperature, make it a little bit warmer. <clears throat> a little bit warmer. That looks good. I like that. So it's pretty good. And then look at the background, look at the trees that blended it in quite nicely. And again, if you wanted to use a different type of uh, sky, you can. I'll throw this on there. That looks okay. It ain't great. That looks pretty dramatic, <laughs> but I don't need it to be that dramatic for that scene. That looks even more natural. So let's click OK. After we fine tune it, hold on. Scale that. Push the edging. Very good. Good. Now, now we we'll click OK. And boom, it's added all of these additional layers that we can work with here. And again, if you want to mess around with the layer mask, you can just click on them and mess around with your layer mask. Uh oh, didn't mean to hit that. Sorry. <laughs> so click your layer mask, grab your brush tool and just go to town with brushing in everything you need to do from a layer mask standpoint. See, this would be totally erasing myself out, which is what we don't want to do. But of course, painting in black hides what's on your current layer and reveals what's on the layer below. And you are good to go. And you can play with all of these additional layers here to do more adjustments. Uh, if you want to get rid of a logo, you can. If you want to uh, do some more color correcting, you can. It's all there and ready to go. That is some pretty cool tech, Adobe. This is quite impressive. Now, so before we get out of here, um, I want to just say thank you to the twit family and the twit army this is episode 52 meaning i've been recording hands-on photography officially for a year and folks this means so much to me man to be able to have this opportunity to share the things that i've learned over the years um being self-taught, didn't go to photography school and film school or any of that stuff for for this craft but I've been able to teach myself a lot of different things with the camera and I've had the opportunity to share it with others. And now I'm able to share it with you, the Twit audience. And I really do appreciate you all just welcoming me to the Twit family. 
to the Twit Army and just being so supportive. It really does mean a lot. I thank you and my family here. We thank you too. All right. That's all I'm going to say on that. <laughs> thank you again for watching this week's episode. I look forward to chatting with you all in the coming weeks. I got some interesting labs that we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some different styles of portraits, and I'm going to walk you through setting all of those things up. It's going to be a lot of fun. So just go ahead and grab your pen and pad, take some notes, go back and check out the previous episodes and download them. So you can make sure you're caught up on all of the different mumbo jumbo and lingo that I'm going to talk about in these upcoming episodes. It's a masterclass. So just treat it like a masterclass and go back and get your lessons. All right. Thank you again, folks. Thank you to Mr. Victor for all of your support and making me look and sound good. Sorry for the camera issues. And again, thank you to Mr. and Mrs. Leo Laporte. I love y'all and I'm so grateful for this opportunity. Real talk. All right, folks, until then, you all safely create and dominate. And I'll catch you next week. Take care. One more twit? Well, check out Hands on iOS, twit.tv slash HOI, where I teach you all about iPhones, iPads, AirPods, Apple Watches, and so much more. If you want to get the most out of your device, then you got to check out Hands on iOS, twit.tv slash HOI.